Hey everyone, this is Peter Liu, and today we'll be talking about colonic and anorectal manometry in children. Uh, so we're going to start first by talking about what these tests are and how we perform these tests, what's normal and abnormal, and how we use those results clinically. We'll start with uh, talking about the indications for manometry testing. So we typically will use manometry testing when we have patients with constipation or fecal incontinence despite quote-unquote optimal conventional treatment. So typically that involves laxatives and a behavioral treatment for children. Manometry testing can help us better understand the underlying mechanism of a child's constipation and in that way can help us think about further treatments and also uh, can look specifically for conditions like Hirschsprung's disease. So we'll talk about colonic manometry first. So colonic manometry evaluates colonic motor activity by recording pressure generated by the colon. And it does this by using a catheter that's placed inside the colon. And the catheter has a series of pressure sensors ar arranged along it. Um, the older water perfused catheters have eight sensors per catheter and the newer solid state catheters have 36. This is a picture of the older water perfused catheters. Um, water is actually being pumped through each one of those red tubes and the resistance to that water flow is what's being measured. But now we primarily have been do using our solid state catheters uh, which are hooked up directly to a computer. That catheter looks like this on an x-ray once it's been placed into the colon. And this is a picture endoscopically of the catheter inside the colon. The tip of the catheter is secured um, ideally to the cecum um, by using a loop of suture that's tied to the tip of the catheter. We then use an endoclip uh, to secure it almost like an anchor to the colonic mucosa. So after the catheter placement, they come to our colonic motility testing room. And there's several phases of the study. So first we look at fasting colonic motor activity, then activity during a meal, and then postprandially. The final phase is when we give them medications like bisocodal and sometimes glycerin to try to provoke a response. This is an example of a tracing from a water perfused catheter. So there's eight sensors and the top line is the one that's furthest inside the colon. The one at the bottom of the screen is the one that's furthest uh, out. So sometimes it's actually out of the body. The X axis is time. And for the water perfused catheter increases in pressures are represented as spikes in that line. But we've been using more solid state catheter uh, catheters more recently. And as you can see in our typical screen for that, uh, we used color to represent pressure. And so blue is the lowest pressure and then green, then yellow, then red, then purple. It's still gonna be the top of the screen is the furthest into the colon, the bottom is the furthest out, and the X axis is again time. This specific image is showing kind of the transition between a fasting phase and a meal. And uh, you'll notice that once we eat this meal, there's a little bit more activity in the colon. This is a low amplitude, so lower pressure, propagating contraction, meaning that it starts more proximally and then moves distally. If we zoomed in, I think it'd be a little more obvious, but we'll have some examples later. And that increase in activity is called the gastrocolic reflex. This is kind of the most, oftentimes the most meaningful part of the study once we like give a stimulant to try to trigger a high amplitude propagating contraction. So you guys can see clearly it's higher pressure. It moves from proximal to distal steadily. And um, that lower line at the bottom of the screen, that area of pressure is actually the anal canal. So you can see that it gets really close down to the anal canal. We don't want it to go all the way down. We want the rectum to be able to store stool. Um, but it gets pretty much all the way down there. And you can tell that with these contractions, the catheter is actually moving out of the body. So um, on the right of the screen, there's some sensors that are actually being pushed out. So this is a sign of good colonic motility. That's in contrast to something like this, where the HAPC moves down to a certain point and then it stops, right? So for this part, you know, half the catheter, so like 18 sensors, um, so depending on the catheter spacing, that'd be maybe like 50 centimeters or so, um, doesn't have any activity. So that's what we um, term segmental colonic dysmotility. We can also look for other things, including behavioral responses to contractions. 
And so it's one of the things that underlines the importance of having a nurse that's always there with them during the study. Um, they, it's maybe hard to see on the computer screen, but they'll write down notes on what the patient's doing. And uh, these notes are describing a child who is crying, denying their urge to stool, stiffening up despite we, you know, we know that there are tons of clonic contractions that should be triggering the urge to have a bowel movement. So this would be evidence for stool withholding. So how do we use these results? Well, if it's normal and there's normal colonic motility, we may further adjust our laxatives. We can consider anterior grade continence enema treatment. Um, so past research from our institution showed that normal colonic motility predicts success. And if it's not the colon, we have to make sure that sometimes the problem is a rectal evacuation issue. So making sure that there's an anorectal manometry that may help us better understand what's going on. Um, if there's evidence of stool withholding, behavioral treatment may be the answer to that. If there's segmental clonic dysmotility, it's probably still worth trying anterior continence enemas first. But if that doesn't work, we could consider segmental clonic resection. And clonic inertia, when there's no motility, especially for younger patients who are failing to thrive, we think about creating an ileostomy, giving the colon some time, restudying in the future, and using that to decide whether a takedown would be appropriate. Um, for older patients, sometimes we'll have to consider more extensive colonic resection. Moving on to anorectal manometry testing. So much like the colonic manometry, this one's measuring anal sphincter and rectal function, but also sensation. And it again involves a catheter that's placed into the lumen. So this one's just into the rectum. The catheter has eight sensors that are arranged much closer with a balloon at the end. It looks kind of like this. This is the solid state version. And uh, the test can be performed awake, which is what we prefer. Typically for kids older than five, um, that's going to be possible. Sometimes younger kids we can manage. Um, but it can also be performed under anesthesia in certain cases. So if kids are delayed, can't tolerate the test, one to five is kind of a tough age. Sometimes it can get by with distraction or sometimes even hypnosis. Um, because of the anesthesia, we'll try to combine it sometimes with an exam under anesthesia, plus or minus an anal sphincter Botox injection. But if it's under anesthesia, it really limits the study to just looking at resting pressure and whether there's a rectal anal inhibitory reflex or RARE, which we'll talk about in a little bit. This is what the catheter and balloon look like um, inside the anal canal and rectum. And when they're awake, the test again goes through several phases. The first one is we we try to measure the resting pressure of the anal sphincter. We ask them to squeeze, measuring their squeeze pressure. We ask them to push. And, uh, and then the nurse will gradually inflate that rectal balloon, which is to look for that rare, but also um, to measure rectal sensory thresholds. This is what the um, tracing looks like. So again, pressure is represented as color. And uh, that bar across the top of the screen is actually the center that's closest, uh, that's most inside the rectum, kind of where the balloon is. And then uh, the other sensors are what's showing that main part of the screen. You can see that there's this area of uh, higher pressure in the middle. So above that is in the rectum and below that's outside. And so that's the resting pressure of the anal canal. And when we um, ask them to squeeze, we see that pressure go up a, a significant amount, which have them hold it. And then when they relax, you see the pressure comes back down again. So this is a normal squeeze pressure. We then ask them to push. And you know, when we push, we expect to see our abdominal pressure, which is uh, translated to rectal pressure. We expect to see that increase, which it does. So you can see an increase in pressure along that top bar. But here you can see the anal canal pressure also increases just as strong, if anything, as strong as the child before who is intentionally squeezing. So this is an abnormal push test. We want to see that pressure actually go down to allow stool to come out. So this test is suggestive of pelvic floor dyssynergia. So there's not coordination between the abdominal uh, pressure and relaxing the pelvic floor. This is an example of a rectal anal inhibitory reflex. So when the rectum senses the balloon being inflated, which we know is happening because of that upper bar up top, you can see the internal part of the sphincter, the upper part, relaxes. When we don't see that, as is the case here, we worry about Hirschsprung's disease. And if rectal biopsy shows that there is not Hirschsprung's disease, then uh, we make the diagnosis of internal anal sphincter achalasia, so just a non-relaxing internal anal sphincter. 
This is an example of a 3D anorectometry, which we do in some cases, it can be harder to tolerate. And we're doing some research actively on whether or not this adds much in children compared to our typical solid state um, manometry catheter. So how do we use these results? Again, if the test is normal, we may still adjust laxative, uh, laxatives. And if it's, you know, you know, just like for a clonic manometry, if it's not the anorectal physiology, then maybe it's the colon. So we can think about doing a colonic manometry. Um, if the anal sphincter resting pressure is very high, you know, we could think about doing an anal sphincter Botox injection. Although there's some more recent evidence, including from us, that maybe, uh, maybe Botox can help even if the, re the resting pressure is normal. Pelvic floor dyssynergia. So it's a little bit harder to diagnose in children, especially young, younger children. But if it's clear that whenever they push, their pelvic floor increases in pressure, um, biofeedback therapy can be an option to try to teach them to relax their bottom when they're trying to push. If there is no rare, so the internal anal sphincter does not relax, like we mentioned, we worry about Hirschsprung, so we want to get a rectal biopsy. But um, regardless if that is uh, abnormal and they have Hirschsprungs, or if it's normal and they have internal anal sphincter achalasia, um, anal sphincter Botox injection could be considered. Finally, um, if you want to read more about this fascinating topic, um, here are a couple um, uh, articles that I think are helpful. So one is the American Neurogastroenterology Motility Society and NASPGAN document on uh, performing anorectal and colonic manometry in children. And the second one is a uh, description that we put together of kind of how we think about uh, the evaluation and treatment of more severe constipation. All right, thank you.